Hello and welcome to Guns and Gunnery, the first part in a mini part series where we cover to cover fighter combat tactics and maneuvering by Robert Shaw. Now this is a great book. This book is a cornerstone of the aerial combat science. It is used in the Naval Institute and often it is the primer that most of these guys go, these real fighter pilots go out and use uh, when they're learning their initial BFM training and or any aerial combat training for that matter. Now this book being as great as it is, I really often don't find any online resources uh, that really cover its material. It's got a lot of great material inside, uh, but I really haven't seen any aerial combat YouTube uh, video series that really get into the nitty gritty of what this book covers. And so I, I've kind of taken it upon myself as a flight instructor, an airline pilot, and a National Guard pilot to just dig, dig through it and, and hopefully we can make something that uh, the entire community can use as a great resource to get a primer into this complicated sport. But without further ado and no more yammering about what the scope of this project is going to be, let's get right into it. When we talk about aerial combat, typically what we think of is the typical dogfight. That's two aircraft maneuvering, trying to get on each other's six. But what this book and what I think is a more valuable perspective is to think of aerial combat as simply... The aircraft is a tool being used to maneuver a weapon into a weapon solution, right? The aircraft is not the weapon, simply a means to situate a weapon into a firing position. And that's what we're going to be talking about, right? Whether that weapon's going to be a gun or a missile or whatever you'd like it to be, our job as a pilot is to maneuver that aircraft into a position where we can fire that weapon. So let's talk about guns. Now, typically when we talk about aerial combat, the most prolific two types of weapons are the cannon and the machine gun. The machine gun was most often used with US World War II fighters when designers realized that their main opposition were going to be fighters, right? The German fighters or the Japanese fighters. And the advantage of the machine gun when we're talking about employing that with a fighter plane is going to be a high rate of fire and a great ballistic trajectory, which that high rate of fire increases, which we're going to talk about much more later on in this episode increases the rate of scoring a hit. Now the downside of using a machine gun is what? Well, a machine gun really only has the, the damage potential of the kinetic energy of the round. You're taking a piece of metal, a bullet, and you're throwing it into another piece of metal. And that's the only reaction that's, occur that's occurring. Now a cannon is completely different, right? It uses an exploding round that is often much larger. We have 20 millimeter cannons up to 40 millimeter cannons in World War II. The A-10, it uses a 30 millimeter cannon. And when we talk about the origin of the cannon in a aerial combat application, it, it was really used to solve a problem, which was what? In World War II, the aircraft got much, much faster. And we needed a, a way to do as much damage in the shortest period of time as we could. So that's when we developed using, hey, let's use explosive rounds. And that'll make it so if we do score a hit, we know that it's going to be a devastating one. Those are often mostly used with you know, the ME-109 and the Japanese Zeros and KIs and N1Ks that you think about what was their primary objective. Well, it was to shoot down bombers because the United States was always flying so many bombers over their airspace. So those are really the only two types of guns that you're going to expect to find in a aerial combat situation. But another interesting characteristic is often where they're mounted. When we talk about where we can mount guns, well, if we were talking about B-17s, we could be mounting them everywhere. But tra traditionally in a fighter sort of application, you're either going to have a cowl-mounted gun that shoots either through your propeller or just on your nose if you're talking about a jet aircraft, or a wing-mounted gun. And a wing-mounted gun has an interesting set of problems that occur when you mount those weapons on the wing. So wing-mounted weapons have the problem of convergence, right? We have to point those weapons at a single area of space, right? So there's two main ways we can solve that problem, right? We can use point harmonization which is when you take every gun and you mount it at a specific range at a specific point. And the problem that occurs when you do that is it's very hard to kill people, right? Because you have to have, for maximum lethality, you need not only that target to fly through those bullets, but it needs to fly through those bullets at that exact range. And you can see where if you have a cow-mounted weapon, it's irrelevant what range, right? You have maximum lethality at all ranges. Most World War II fighter pilots uh, on the American side using the Ma Deuce, which was the 3-in-3 the three three 50 caliber machine guns, the Brownings, 
found it very difficult to score a hit because you had, if you're using point harmonization, you had to get them at that specific range. So a lot of them use the alternate alternative method, which would be pattern harmonization. And that's when you treat your gun cluster more like a shotgun. Instead of aiming every single barrel at a specific point, you stagger them, right? So you have one set at 300 yards, one set at 350 yards, and one set at 400 yards. And that creates a spread. And while not nearly as lethal as if you would have got them right on that point, it drastically increases your chance of scoring a hit on the enemy. And that's really what it comes down to, right? Is when we talk about guns only fights, we're really talking about one of the most important aspects is accuracy. So much so that a lot of these World War II pilots would come back saying things like, you know, the maneuvering side of the fight was a lot, uh, took a back seat completely to the gunnery. If you were only able to maneuver into a situation where you get one opportunity to fire your weapon, but you meet that opportunity every single time and score hits, you're often going to find yourself performing much better than a pilot who is able to maneuver um, but seems to miss most of their shots, right? It doesn't matter if you can give yourself eight snapshots in a one-on-one -on -one engagement if you miss six of those and your opponent is only able to get one shot but instantly kills you. The last thing we need to talk about when we talk about guns just in and of themselves is the gun lethality table. The gun lethality table is great because it gives you an insight into the real science behind why some rounds and some weapon systems are more effective than others. The idea is that lethality can be measured by multiplying the destructive power of a projectile and the number of hits. Now what is destructive power? Well, we measure destructive power as the kinetic energy, which is half the mass of the bullet, times its velocity. And typically what you would need to accurately solve this problem is you'd need impact velocity, which is very hard to measure, right? So what we use typically is muzzle velocity. The muzzle velocity times half the mass gets you damage potential. And the, the observant out of there will say, well, okay, well, what about cannons, right? Well, cannons explode. How do we measure the explosive damage? Well, this chart does not do that. It is not going to account for the additional damage that a cannon shell will do when it explodes. So while that is a limitation of this table, it still lets you accurately look at the damage lethality, the damage potential between cannon shells. But it is going to underrate the FL of those cannons in comparison to the machine guns. So... When you're looking at those figures, don't compare a cannon's FL directly to a machine gun's FL because, again, we're not using the explosive energy from that shell in the calculation. So this is a great, insightful table, but it does have other limitations other than the cannon stuff. And that's going to be, it doesn't account for very obvious things, right? It doesn't account for the P-51's gyroscopic gun sight, which we're going to cover later, right? That's going to increase your chance of getting higher hits, right? So... While lethality in a vacuum is a valuable piece of information and something definitely to consider, um, there's oftentimes other factors like maneuverability of the aircraft and the gunnery gun sights that can greatly increase the lethality of a weapon system. And then by that, I mean the entire aircraft as a whole. Now, that being said, there is a particular characteristic of a gun system that often is paramount to the others in real aerial combat. And I will admit that that's not typically the case necessarily in simulators. DCS is pretty good about it. I've played some others that, you know, despite the low rate of fire cannons are the name of the game, but in real aerial combat, rate of fire is typically king, right? Because we talked about previously, accuracy is more important oftentimes than aircraft maneuverability and the maneuvering of the aircraft itself. And additionally, rate of fire is often more impressive and will get you better results than the lethality of the round. Because the more the more shells we can put out, the higher chances of scoring a hit, right? If I can do 3,000 rounds a minute, you know, there's if I'm on, I've hit you with 50 of them. Whereas if I'm using, you know, a really low rate of fire weapon like the Mark 108 cannon in the ME109, well, my rate of fire is miserable. And so when my pipper's on you, there's only a few few rounds that are coming your way. So now we're going to move on to air-to-air -air gunnery, which is just going to be the act of actually aiming and firing a weapon and the positions in space those aircraft need to make up to get the gunnery done. To start off, I wanted to read something that I kind of paraphrased from Shaw's book, which I thought was a great intro. 
Air-to-air -air gunnery is a complicated physics problem involving hitting a moving target from a moving shooting position with a round following a curved trajectory at rapidly varying speeds. Now if you think about that, that's kind of crazy. The amount of calculations that have to go into a gun solution when you're firing a weapon is mind-boggling, right? If you if you ha if snipers had to calculate that many trajectories and that many parameters, they'd never score a hit. Which is why we have weapons that shoot over a thousand rounds a minute because we need that many chances. <laughs> so what we're gonna do, and, and what is what the book does as well, is we're gonna break down the steps to getting a gun solution uh, down step by step. So. Well, we're going to start out with just some acronyms to know when we talk about the science of setting up a shot and the physics behind it. We have TOP, time of flight, LOS, line of sight, TAA, target aspect angle, and TOF, time of firing, uh, as well as, sorry, GBL, gun bore line. Now, before we get into this stuff too deeply and you're throwing your arms up saying, okay, I don't need to go out here doing vector physics every time I just want to get a kill, um, you know, that's going to be too much. You're right, you're absolutely right. This is a baseline science as to how this gunnery stuff works. Try to conceptualize it and integrate it into your subconscious so when you go out there and you're in these actual engagements, you can use some of these lessons to make you more effective with what you're doing. Every single pilot out there is completely doing things by the seat of their pants, whether they, sit, whether they admit it or not, when they're out there in an actual fight. That being said, here's a great quote from Shaw's book by Lieutenant General Gunther Rail, which was the third leading Luf Luftwaffe ace, uh, and he says this, I had no system of shooting as such. It is definitely more in the feeling side of things as these skills develop. I was at the front five and a half years, and you just get a feeling for the right amount of lead. And like I said, that's absolutely right. That's exactly the way it ends up being. But still, we're going to go, you know, keep digging through this stuff and make sure that, okay, there's nothing that I'm missing, right? Now I can go out there and be confident that I can analyze these situations that I get into with a scientific eye. So to start off, let's talk about a super simple one, like line of sight, right? That's going to be this green line here. And you can see as this fight progresses, we can move. And as, as this aircraft moves, this is a fight between me and a P-51, that line of sight changes, right? That line of sight moves. Now my line of sight, if I'm looking directly at him, is that line there, right? Super simple. Now, where it often gets complicated when you're reading through Shaw's book is when we talk about target aspect angle. What is target aspect angle? Well, that's going to be super simple, right? We talked about target aspect angle is the angle between the target's velocity vector and the line of sight. And the thing that's lovely about tack view is that it gives us that angle here. The line of sight is the green line, and his velocity vector is the blue line. So you can see as this moves how aspect angle changes. You see when we're a beam an opponent right there, well, pretty close right there. If we zoom in, target aspect angle is about 90 degrees. Whereas if we back the fight up to when he was in front of us at 12 o'clock, his aspect angle gets pretty narrow, right? Very small angle. Now we're off setting, so there's still a little bit of an angle there, but you can see that is a very small aspect shot, right? Almost zero degrees. Now, if you're on a target six, Right, you can see how uh, that 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 aspect angle is going to be about 180 degrees because that line is going to be directly behind him, and then 180 degrees is what it would take. Right, so that's target aspect angle, pretty easy stuff. Now, as this fight progresses through this rolling type of scissors maneuver, we are going to talk about uh, the few other things. We're going to talk about time of fly firing, time of flight, and gun bore line. Right. So those are all going to be very important when we talk about eventually a lead calculation for our lead angle. We need to know those factors, and they're more often intuited than anything else. So when we talk about a lead shot, we talk about first time of firing, right? That's going to be the exact frame you first see munitions leave the barrel, right? That's the time of firing. The time of firing has to be on mark with time of flight, right? So when we talk about time of flight, TOP, it needs to be the same duration it takes him at crossing speed to move from here to here. We talk about crossing speed, how that's the biggest thing when, when we're calculating lead. Well, the, his crossing speed right now is nearly all of his velocity. 
Uh, his velocity now is, well, I don't know how it's playing, but his velocity now, whatever he's doing, is all nearly crossing velocity. If we look through at the HUD, you can see he's moving through my pipper at max rate um, that he can do. So in that respect, he's, this is a very hard shot. This is called a snapshot. So we've got to calculate that lead for all of his velocity. So the GBL gun bore line is the pink line, right? We talk about target velocity vector, but at this point, I'm pretty much unloaded. I'm not pulling any Gs, and the only projectile drop is going to be from gravity and uh, aerodynamic drag. And you can see, let's see, you can even see that I've even got a little of that planned for there, right? You can see that pink line going above his blue line, which is me anticipating for projectile drop. So as he moves through... You can see the hits make it there. So super simple stuff, right? Gun bore line in, in a cow mounted aircraft um, without a lot of G forces, it, there's no trajectory jump. It's going to be right down the target, uh, your velocity vector, a gun bore line. And time of flight is going to be the time it took these shells to get to him. And time of firing is the exact moment that I shot. Pretty simple stuff, right? So to get an accurate gun solution, we've got to calculate all those things. We've got to get an accurate lead idea of what, how much lead we want. We have to understand that crossing speed is everything. We have to understand how much he's crossing, how quickly he's doing that, calculate that lead, and then calculate more lead for, okay, how much is my bullet going to drop? How much G's am I pulling? Because if I'm pulling, you know, if I'm in a, you know, the, a lot of times uh, World War II gunnery guides would say you want to only fire in an unloaded situation. You only want to fire your weapon if you can fire that without any elevator at all, right? Well, that's impossible. We know that, right? A lot of opportunities that are great opportunities to kill an opponent are going to happen in a G'd situation where you're loading the aircraft. So we got to calculate that drop as well. And if we can do all of that, and then we get a trigger pull, time of firing, and a TOP, uh, the path time of the projectile, uh, and then nothing happens from the moment we did that to the moment we pulled, then we'll score a hit. So that's really the basis of it, right? We have to understand those parameters in order to calculate the lead that we need to calculate. Now, again, this stuff is super complicated. When we're doing all these things, a lot of it's going to be seat of your pants type of, you know, figuring uh, until we get into uh, gyroscopic um, gun sights and other advanced types of gun sights that we're going to talk about in the next video. Um, but I do want to take this moment just to read one last quote. I know the quotes are rough, but I'm just a history nerd, so I love reading this stuff. As to gunnery passes, the best was when you dived with speed, made one pass, shot an opponent down quickly, and pulled back up. The secret was to do the job in one pass. It could be from the side or behind, and I usually tried to open fire at about 150 feet. And that's Major Eric Rudolfer of the Luftwaffe. Now, if you think about that, 150 feet, that is nothing. That's fill your windscreen with the enemy and then just pull the trigger. So a lot of these guys, with as complicated as this stuff and the technology that they were using, they still found it most effective to just fill the windscreen with the enemy. One last thing before we wrap up this video is about tracers. Now, a lot of these World War II and on, they still use tracers. Systems use a tracer round, which is around an incendiary round that you're able to see. And the beautiful part about tracers uh, is a double-edged sword, right? A tracer lets you see your bullet drop. It lets you see the trajectory of your round, which able which is it enables you to correct your lead, right? If you see your tracers going underneath your opponent, you can walk those tracers up to your opponent. That's great. Problem that occurs is that if you miss, right? If you miss an opponent that is you know, previously unaware of your position behind him and those tracers go over his canopy, he's gonna know he's being fired at and immediately go defensive, which greatly complicates your situation. So if we're going back to Eric Rudolfer's idea of, you know, just jump attack people and fill the windscreen. Well, if you've got tracers on and you're using them, you better not miss, right? That's all for our first section on air-to-air -air gunnery. Pretty basic stuff, just kind of setting out the framework for what we're going to use when we expanded that. Expand on everything in the next section. We're going to get into gun sights and more tactics and specific things like that. So tune back in next time. Have a cup of coffee with you. I'm going to get even deeper into this stuff.